Aloha. Welcome to the East West Center and welcome to this edition of East West Center Insights. My name is Denny Roy. I'm a senior fellow with the East West Center. I'll be moderating today. Our featured speaker is Dr. Dong Jun Park. He's a senior researcher at Cordial University in Seoul. He'll be talking to us about South Korea's crisis management behavior. Our session today is an hour total. So Dr. Park will speak to us for about 40 minutes. Afterwards, we'll have a question and answer session. Those of you participating online, you can ask your questions by typing your question into the Q&A box you'll see near the bottom of your screen. Dr. Park. Uh, all right, thanks, Denny. Uh, uh, as just was announced, uh, my name is Dong Jun Park. I'm uh, currently a visiting fellow here, a uh, POSCO visiting fellow. Um, and before I begin, I really wanted to use this opportunity to thank Denny, Carolyn, and really everybody here at the East West Center for being so hospitable and, 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 and making my stay here um, as productive and enjoyable <laughs> as possible. So today, um, oh, actually, let me just share. So as the title indicates, and, and my apologies, I did um, slightly change the subtitle for today's topic, but the main title is the same. It's called Retribution or Restraint. Um, and basically it talks about reputation for resolve, a concept that is uh, becoming increasingly popular, although not necessarily new in the field of IR. And so I'll be talking about how um, I wish to make a contribution to those debates um, but also in terms of policy making as well, how I think my research might lead to some uh, interesting implications about how to deter adversaries and, and basically manage uh, stable relations between enemies. Um, so uh, with that brief introduction, oh, um, and also to provide a little context. So this comes from my dissertation, which I uh, was able to uh, complete in, in the summer of 2020 from Georgetown. Um, and so uh, obviously it's a, it's, a, it's a much broader project, but this, the, the, the presentation that I'll be giving today um, is basically the theory chapter plus some parts of the empirical evidence that I found um, in support of, of my argument. So with that, um, here's how I've um, outlined today's uh, talk. Um, and so I'll begin with the puzzle that's driving uh, my research, um, uh, the research questions that I've devised to get at the, the puzzle at hand. And in doing so, I wanted to talk um, a bit more about the concept itself, reputation for resolve. Um, this, should, this should be something that is quite intuitive, but I also wanted to kind of go into a bit more detail about how scholars in the field of IR are talking about reputation for resolve. Um, and so uh, based on um, that explanation, I wanted to then move on to the existing literature um, and some conventional wisdoms that many scholars have developed as um, we, we know and have learned more and more about this concept and how it works. Um, while doing so, I wanted to talk about how I think there are still gaps that might be filled and need to be filled. Um, and so um, kind of using that as a segue, I wanted to present my own argument, what I've been trying to call a theory of moderate reputation um, um, as, as kind of a, not necessarily uh, disproving existing literature, but as a way of adding to our understanding of, of the concept. And so after outlining um, the argument and, and explaining the logic behind it in a bit more detail, uh, I wanted to move on to the case studies, which will be um, South Korea's responses to assassination attempts uh, on the South Korean president by North Korea during the Cold War. And there are two uh, such episodes, and I'll be comparing and talking about um, the, the evidence that it provides. And so to conclude, I'll briefly summarize um, the talk and then move on to talking about uh, implications of the research, as well as um, introducing how I've been thinking about um, expanding on this topic expanding on uh, my existing research to kind of build uh, uh, as a result. So that'll be, our, uh, that'll be my plan for today. So the puzzle that I'm trying to address is um, basically why do states uh, during crises back down despite the risk of harming the reputation for resolve? 
Um, and the research question that I've um, uh, been working on is whether or not states and leaders, these key international uh, key actors in international politics, whether or not they actually believe that cultivating a strong reputation for resolve is always in their best interests. Um, and um, if not, why might actors prefer a different reputation for resolve? Some might call it weak. Uh, I tend to call it uh, moderate uh, and use try to use different terms for it. And I'll explain the logic behind that as well. But that is basically the puzzle and the research question um, that I want to address. And I will, I'll, I'll come back to these um, in later slides. Um, again, this should be something that um, should be uh, understandable quite intuitively, but um, a lot of scholars have focused on reputation for resolve as this key concept in, in, in international relations. Um, and I wanted to talk about that concept by breaking down the two components to them. So the first is resolve. Um, and um, similar to how we commonly use it, um, it, it refers to an actor's firmness or uh, steadfastness of purpose, meaning that you're not going to back down, you're not going to concede, you're determined in seeing things through and you're, you're, you're determined um, to win out uh, whatever conflict dispute that you're engaged in. And so uh, one of the implications of this definition is that in IR, we talk about it in terms of a state or a leader's willingness to take risks, meaning that they're willing to use violence as a way of um, not necessarily demonstrating resolve, but achieving the goals that they set out to achieve. Uh, and by inference, we then kind of take that as, oh, that actor is going to be resolved, seeing that that's how willing they are to take those risks um, to achieve those goals. And so that's one component. The other component is reputation. And again, this is very similar to how we use it in everyday life. Um, I am concerned about my performance here today because that's going to affect my reputation in the future. And that's how kind of reputations work. Um, and so it's, it's, it's beliefs about certain traits, certain behavioral tendencies of an actor that are going to be based on observed past actions. And that's the whole idea of, of reputation. And reputations um, is something that many people have kind of looked at um, uh, and, and thought about different types of reputations that can be associated with states as international actors. So resolve kind of being the key uh, type, but also for, for things like honesty, for example, how often have states been caught uh, bluffing or, or um, how reliable are they as allies? Um, or, or even credit worthiness, how often do they uh, repay their debts? And that's going to have an impact on their future interactions. So for example, for, for credit worthiness, if you're credit worthy, then that's going to benefit you in terms of your ability to access the international financial market in the future. And so that's how we, we tend to believe that reputations do indeed matter in international politics and for states as well. I mean, so despite how there are these different types, uh, much of the research has been focused on reputation for resolve. Um, and so combining the two concepts together, we, we re reach this definition of the belief that an actor will stand firm and even resort to the use of force if necessary based on their past actions. And so why is this important? Why do we pay so much attention to this? It's because resolve is something that is unobserved. It is, it is what we call private information. And so even though it's crucial to how conflicts, bargains uh, end up being resolved, we have no idea of assessing them. It, it's going to be um, uh, hard to assess others' uh, uh, level of resolve. And in some cases, it's even hard for, for that particular actor to understand their own level of resolve. So there's a lot of uncertainty uh, involved there's also a lot of incentives to misrepresent. If I can show you that I'm more resolved than I actually might be, then that'll lead to uh, certain benefits. And so there's always going to be uh, those types of uh, incentives. And, and from uh, by drawing from insights from uh, cognitive psychology, one of the problems is that when you're trying to assess resolve, there's also too many indicators. What do you kind of base your uh, assessments on? Uh, is it um, your statements? Is it your uh, material power? 
things like your economy or your military power. There are all these different indicators that are obviously going to work at the same time. And so how do you make sense of this all? And so given this complexity, given this uncertainty, reputations then becomes a very important heuristic. Um, this cognitive shortcut that many actors use to assess others' uh, level of resolve. And this is because, again, the fact that you've used military force in the past or you've threatened it very convincingly in the past, that is, is deemed to be a very credible indicator uh, of uh, an actor's resolve. And so this is why we've uh, spent so much time um, and, and attention to this topic. And it's not only academics. Um, you, can, you can see, especially in American foreign policy, how this logic has driven a lot of foreign policy decisions, key ones. Um, most of the intuitions from Thomas Schelling and his work um, uh, early in the Cold War kind of drive still how, how we think about the concept. So um, in, his, in his book, uh, he talks about how face, which is another a similar uh, synonym to reputation, how face, in his view, is one of the few things worth fighting for. Um, and so using the example of the Korean War, it was undoubtedly worth it, according to Schelling, to sacrifice essentially 30,000 uh, American troops in Korea, not necessarily to save South Korea, but to demonstrate American reputation to save face for the United States and the United Nations. Um, and so, and this, is, this has been, out through, uh, been throughout history. Uh, again, uh, the fears uh, related to harming one's reputation is, uh, is largely derived from the Munich Canal. So again, pretty famous, I'm sure uh, all of you know, uh, the, the picture on, on the top there uh, is of Neville Chamberlain um, uh, upon his return from Berlin uh, after meeting uh, Adolf Hitler, kind of waving the, the Munich Agreement and, and declaring peace in our time, which uh, I won't digress uh, on how that's, that statement has been interpreted, but nevertheless, um, it's been reported uh, recorded that uh, Hitler himself talks about how um, he considered his enemies as worms, as these weak individuals, weak leaders that he can push around. And he was basing that assessment of his opponent's resolve on his interactions at Munich. Um, and so this is, this, is, this is kind of the cautionary tale that many leaders have since used to kind of justify uh, military interventions. Um, uh, more recently, there has been this debate in the US um, over reputation, because of um, the Syrian red line uh, uh, situation. Uh, some might call it catastrophe. Uh, just the, the background is how uh, in 2012, uh, before um, uh, when, when President Obama was talking about the, uh, the potential use of chemical weapons by Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad, um, he, he, he mentioned the red line, how the use of chemical weapons would constitute this red line for the US which would change American calculations, implying that the U.S. would then intervene. But, um, uh, but when um, chemical weapons were then used a couple of years later, the U.S. Uh, obviously didn't uh, intervene, which led to a lot of controversy, a lot of criticism about how that whole episode had lost American face, lost and harmed American reputation. And you might see arguments um, blaming that incident for a variety of different outcomes, negative outcomes that we've observed since then. Some have tied it to Russians, uh, Russia, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, not uh, not only in twenty, uh, not only last year, but uh, uh, the initial one in two thousand fourteen and fifteen. Uh, North, uh, the inability of the international community to prevent North Korea from further developing its nuclear weapons, or even Chinese assertiveness. All of these, in some, uh, the, the the critics will tie the loss of face, uh, the loss of reputation um, to these events, kind of signaling how it emboldens adversaries. And it's not only the US. I'm sure every country has leaders that have at some point been accused of being too weak or, or being appeasers. Um, and so you, you see how this has often been um, kind of mentioned and raised, um, kind of again, signaling how many are concerned about these reputational concerns. And so looking at the literature, um, there are there's a variety of ongoing debates um, uh, about 
uh, how reputations matter in international relations. Um, if I were to distill the conventional wisdom, some things that we generally agree upon, it would be those that in general, theoretically speaking, at least the, there are these key benefits of having and cultivating a strong reputation for resolve. Um, as I've mentioned before, it makes threats, uh, it makes threats more credible. Um, and this is important for deterrence, for coercion, anything that involves the threat of the use of force. Um, it's also um, understood to increase bargaining leverage. So when you're engaging in negotiations, when you're trying to reach a bargain, if you are deemed to be more resolved, more determined than that, um, is thought to um, make it more likely that you'll gain more favorable terms. Uh, in terms of domestic politics, it's also believed that it actually might prolong leaders' tenure because there is this tendency among the public um, to uh, value the strength of a leader or, or, or consider it as a sign of competence. And so there are all, all these different reasons why um, it might be beneficial to cultivate a strong reputation for his all. And this makes reputation a very valuable political asset. But herein lies the question. Even though cultivating a strong reputation for resolve matters and it is beneficial for, for leaders and states, not every crisis escalates. You'll see even among, among adversaries, uh, even among rivals, concessions often frequently being offered. So why is this the case? How does reputation function in those types of situations? And so returning to the puzzle, this is kind of um, how I started off with this project of, of thinking about how does reputation work when you see states back down? It's, it's obvious why reputation for resolve might incentivize and motivate states to stand firm and try to, be, try to appear as res resolute. But what, how does it work when it's the opposite, when states back down? And so that's kind of um, the, 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 the thinking behind the, the, the puzzle, kind of thinking about existing arguments for why states back down, and there have been some. And it's, at, at this point, it's important to kind of emphasize that neither myself or any of the scholars in the field think of reputation for resolve as a ubiquitous concept. It's not the only thing that's driving crisis decision bargaining. There will be uh, there will be a plethora of, of different different factors that are involved. Um, but in terms of trying to identify and isolate the, the the functions, we do make these kind of um, more simplistic arguments to kind of highlight the the role of reputation for resolve. But but that being said, um, the again the general consensus view is that uh, it's a pretty straightforward argument that. Uh, actors will defend their reputation by, by standing firm, by uh, threatening and actually using force when reputation is deemed to matter. And, and this could be because of a variety of reasons. Uh, most notably, in terms of strategic interactions, reputation for resolve only matters if you're able to use it in later conflict uh, or, or later uh, bargaining situations. And so when the prospect of future conflicts is high, that's when it's supposedly going to matter most because it's going to have the most value. And so things like histo uh, history or, or uh, geographical proximity between different uh, adversaries, uh, basically rivalries, being the context in which reputations will likely matter most. Um, uh, if you think about hegemons also, um, given how they are likely to face multiple threats, um, some consider cultivating a strong reputation for resolve as um, combating those threats and challenges on the cheap. Because once you invest in your reputations, then that enables you to kind of thwart away different threats without actually having to. So um, those are kind of the situations where reputation should matter more and therefore kind of factor as a key reason why states stand firm. Um, uh, recent research is also kind of um, started to look uh, specifically at how certain leaders have different views on um, how uh, some leaders will care more about reputations than others. And this is because of their dispositions or, or um, backgrounds experience. Um, and so you see these individual level kind of explanations at the same time as well. So this is, these are the arguments for why states 
stand firm to defend their reputations. The, the, the rationale for why states might back down is kind of the opposite. So you would expect states to back down when reputations matter less. Um, and so uh, more specifically, it could be because when actors uh, either rationally or irrationally fail to appreciate the importance of, of reputation for result. So Chamberlain kind of being the um, quintessential example of this. Uh, reputations also can unlikely matter if you're not going, you're not expecting to be engaged in a conflict in future. So it, but, uh, a current conflict might be of just of happenstance. And if you're relatively confident of your, your safety and stability, then you don't really need to take the risks involved because it is, there are these short-term costs involved with cultivating a strong reputation. You don't need to take that risk. And so under those conditions, um, it might be, uh, it might make sense not to care um, and not try to defend your uh, reputation. And then in, in terms of individual differences, ultra, as I uh, explained earlier, individual differences or, or personalities might have a lot to do with whether or not you decide uh, to defend or, or, or defend your reputations or back down. So I'm not saying that these explanations are, are wrong. Rather, what I'm trying to argue is that there still might be some areas where uh, we, we lack an explanation for. Um, and this is in part because although we can deduct how existing theories might explain instances of states backing down, in reality, the literature generally is less concerned. We look at um, cases where states do indeed stand firm. And this remains kind of um, an undescribed, underdescribed uh, aspect of, of uh, the field. Um, also, I think there are these uh, additional reasons why existing explanations might be incomplete. Um, so one of the uh, few widely accepted views in the field among scholars that study reputations is that actors and especially leaders are indeed very much concerned about their reputations, perhaps more so than they actually should be. Um, and so that um, needs to be kind of more incorporated. If that is the case, then we would expect it to some, somehow function when states decide to back down, if that's the case. Also, the static nature of situational variables. So in terms of a rivalry, if you're in a rivalry, it would mean that you would continuously expect states to want to stand firm, which is not always going to be the case. Um, the third kind of reason that I um, outline is that I think there are certain potential costs um, and potential pitfalls that I think defending reputation, the logic behind it kind of under um, estimates, which I try to incorporate in my theory. And then lastly, uh, when thinking about reputation for resolve, because of how it's so oriented towards security um, and how it's really kind of designed as this way of strengthening deterrence, it's narrowed our vision. Whereas a state in any given situation will kind of try to juggle a variety of different foreign policies. So deterrence obviously being a key one, but that's not going to be the only one. And so how does uh, uh, efforts to bolster one's reputation affect other foreign policy goals? And so those are kind of the intuitions um, leading to my alternative argument. Um, and it kind of follows the same uh, logic. Um, if I talk about the argument first, actors back down when they prefer the reputation that gives that. So meaning, they can deliberately want uh, what's generally called a weak reputation, but I, what I prefer to call as either a soft or a moderate reputation, because that is actually in their best interest. Um, and so, um, uh, and I try to do so by relaxing the assumption that is underlining a lot of the work, meaning that a strong reputation is always gonna be beneficial. What might be other conditions where that might actually not be the case? If that is not the case, if, if a softer reputation, if a more moderate one um, actually benefits what the state is trying to do, then, then it makes a lot of sense. It's strategically in, uh, beneficial for states to back down, to cultivate that different type of reputation for result. And so that's kind of the argument in crux. 
Um, here's how I've uh, visualized um, how my argument kind of compares with the existing literature. And my apologies, I'm probably um, turning the, the broad literature into a, a complete straw man, but this is just to kind of highlight how my argument kind of differs in perspective. And so on the, on the top, you see the existing literature. When, when uh, an actor cares about the reputation, it leads them to stand firm. And that makes a lot of sense. When they don't, when they um, are not as concerned about reputations, that leads them, it makes them more likely to back down. The distinction that I make is uh, within the existing literature, standing firm and cultivating a strong reputation for result is a very intentional act. Whereas uh, on the bottom, backing down is something that you sacrifice. And so you just have to take it's not, a, it's not an intentionally driven kind of argument. And that's why it's also in a dotted line because of the uh, uh, relatively lack of attention drawn to this kind of uh, relationship. Whereas my alternative argument, kind of uh, an, an, um, an implicit assumption that I make is that more often than not, in, in line with the consensus view within the literature, you'll see reputational concerns always being a fact. So uh, even though I have a section on why uh, cases where reputational concerns aren't uh, existence, I actually consider that to be quite unlikely. Um, and so you'll, you'll uh, in some way, shape or form, states will be concerned, actors will be concerned, but where the variation occurs is whether or not you want a strong or a soft reputation. So it's about the preferences, the type of reputation that you want that will determine your actions thereafter. And so you can pursue or try to cultivate a strong reputation or a more moderate one. And so why is this the case? Why do states want a softer reputation? And I provide two mechanisms or logics. The first is uh, when you have this uh, impetus to avoid what I call reputation races. So the logic here is I am applying the spiral logic instead of the deterrence logic. The, the standard argument goes that by standing firm, by cultivating a strong reputation, that allows me to deter future crises, which is all well and good. But what happens when the adversary decides to challenge regardless? Then if reputations matter, then that actually means, and if the other side has observed your stronger reputation, the future challenge is inevitably going to be stronger just by the function of your reputation. So maybe you win out the first crisis, but future crises will be more, uh, more um, uh, dangerous as a result. And so you see escalation across crises, the next crisis being more dangerous than the first as a function of your reputation for resolve. And these are the additional costs that I explain uh, associated with the strategy of, of cultivating a strong reputation. And so if you anticipate, if you fear reputation races and you want to avoid them in the first place, then that creates incentives for you to try not to kind of engage in this kind of behavior in the first place and why you might want to back down as a result. And so that's the second, that, that's the first logic. The second logic is when you want to escape the bargainers dilemma. And so this is bringing in different foreign policy goals. Um, a strong reputation, as I explained earlier, might increase your bargaining leverage. But at the same time, it also makes the onset of bargains uh, or negotiations that much more difficult. If you're thinking about the other side, the other side has little incentive or less incentive to engage in negotiations where you're expecting uh, the other side to give up very little. And so why bother engaging in the first place? I mean, so if you think about this and if your intentions are more closer to beginning negotiations for whatever reason, it could be to build trust or in some cases it, negotiations themselves might be um, an end in itself. And so if that's your goal, uh, then um, backing down might be an effective pre-negotiation tactic, a tactic before the negotiations or negotiations for the negotiations. And so in, in a lot of ways, you're sacrificing leverage, which means that um, the moment that you do get to that initial bargain, acknowledging that you've sacrificed it, you're not necessarily going to be looking for or not going to be as concerned about reaching an agreement because you understand 
that negotiations were reached by sacrificing leverage. And so um, it's really about maintaining talks, maintaining dialogue for other purposes. Um, and you can kind of think about um, uh, how that could manage tensions and how um, that allows the country to kind of focus on different goals. And so um, it's, it's here where other foreign policy might, uh, might uh, matter. And so uh, very quickly talking about the empirical evidence, um, I, I, ta uh, I just uh, examine South Korea's responses to two assassination attempts. The first uh, being the, the Blue House Raid in 1968. Um, and the second being the Rangoon booming, uh, bombing in, in 1983. Um, so there are two different presidents at the time uh, in Korea, uh, but their responses were also starkly different. So in 1968, President Park wanted to um, seek retribution, basically strike back, whereas President Chun uh, demonstrated quite a lot of restraint. Um, so given, given the, the, the focus of my theory, um, I'm more interested in, in the Rangoon bombing case uh, and why President Chun decided essentially to back down and demonstrate this kind of restraint. Um, uh, I'm actually gonna skip this part, um, moving on to, to the case study. So the background, um, this was in 1968. Um, it, was, it was during a, a period of uh, acute crises throughout the 1960s, um, to the extent that some have even called it the second Korean War. Uh, which, which really culminated in 1968, uh, in the January of 1968, with the Blue House raid on January 21st, and then the capture of the Pueblo um, just a couple of days after. So you can kind of see the tensions there. The response, I think, is kind of kind of the standard argument. The President Park really wanted to stand firm, to retaliate, um, to demonstrate resolve, to cultivate this strong reputation for resolve. So he wanted to eliminate the, uh, the unit responsible for these assassins to really teach Kim Jong Il a, le uh, Kim Il -sung a lesson. Um, and this was so, he was so adamant that the US was so uh, concerned enough to uh, send Cyrus Vance, uh, a close uh, confidant of, of President uh, Johnson at the time, um, to kind of damp down um, and try to persuade. Uh, President Park otherwise, and then this resulted in the US RK during communique. And so the South Koreans didn't, uh, ended up not retaliating as a result. But um, there, is, um, uh, there have been since reports that even after the communique, uh, President Park was so adamant that he actually created his own assassination team to dispatch um, to North Korea, which I present as evidence of, of uh, President Park's intent of, of retaliating even against the wills of, will of um, the US. And so, um, right, so what are the reasons? Well, it should be pretty explanatory, but um, South Korea wanted and needed to bolster its reputation for resolve. Um, there was that um, fear that we, uh, the, the perception of being weak would invite further aggression by this, uh, the North Koreans, that it would embolden North Korea further to attack um, the U.S. as well. Um, per my logic, um, I don't find any concern of a reputation increase. And here, this is one of the points where uh, the South Koreans diverged a lot with the Americans. Americans being very concerned about escalation with the in interventions of the USSR and China, whereas President Park displayed none of that, how he was very confident that the U.S., um, uh, that it would be contained. Even if there are these tit-for-tat responses, it would still be contained. President Park also did, uh, expla uh, exhibited no desire of, of engaging in any negotiations at all. And he was uh, completely focused on gaining the upper hand, making sure that he had enough leverage. And this whole period uh, under his uh, regime um, was basically kind of termed as competition without dialogue. And so this again, um, I, I believe is the reason why he, he uh, thought that cultivating a strong reputation uh, made the most sense. Um, and I compare that with the assassination attempt in 1983. So the background here is that um, during uh, President Park, uh, President Chun's uh, state visit throughout South Asia, Southeast Asia during his trip in uh, Myanmar, um, the bombs, bombing occurred um, uh, and, and President Chun himself was uh, very 
uh, luckily able to uh, avoid being killed, um, but four of his high ranking uh, officials uh, were indeed um, uh, killed as a result, including his farm minister um, at the time. Um, and this was also a period um, consistent with the rivalry that you had security concerns, but also with um, uh, diplomatic and economic competition uh, raging on between the two Koreas. And so the response was surprising that um, Pre President Chun chose to demonstrate a lot of restraint. Um, right after he turned to Korea, the ambassador um, to, uh, to South Korea, the American ambassador, kind of uh, reported that President Chun re uh, seemed remarkably calm, calm and controlled. Uh, having, having no indication that he would um, uh, seek retaliation or retribution, um, explicitly uh, reassuring the Americans that uh, he, the South Koreans would not retaliate in, in response. Um, more surprising is that um, as early as in early 1984, just a few months after the bombing attempt, South Korea was very willing to engage in negotiations. It was part, uh, it was not as significant, it was over sports, um, but still, if you think about what had just transpired, it's very surprising that South Koreans would actually want to engage in talks of any kind. Um, there's also the episode of uh, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aid that the North Koreans actually provided to the South Koreans. And if you think about the whole idea of reputation prestige, it is something that the South Koreans, you would expect them not to accept, but surprisingly they did. And so those are kind of the reasons why I consider this an example of, of backing down. And the logic here uh, from the evidence is that President Chun had very uh, sincere concerns about um, North Korea's intentions, how engaging in, in these military uh, conflicts would play into North Korea's hands. Um, and he had this, uh, inherent desire to kind of bring North Korea to the bargaining team. Um, I, I also talk about this, um, the significance of the 1988 Seoul Olympics. And uh, central to hosting the uh, Olympics was maintaining stability on the Korean peninsula. And so to achieve that, negotiations had a lot of merit. Not necessarily to reach a bargain, but to uh, assuage concerns. And it, it's hard to see reputational concerns not being a factor given how the public and the military really demanded a, a military response. And so to conclude, I'm just returning to the, the, the argument, um, I, I kind of try to uh, explain why in some instances states might actually uh, prefer a weak or a softer reputation. And I do so in this particular project by comparing South Korea's responses. Um, the implications, I think, is that uh, we often think of deterrence as a silver bullet, um, as something that can solve every um, issue, when in reality, deterrence in itself is a strategy that has its own limitations. And so the reputation, a race aspect kind of gets those uh, limitations and then uh, I think has implications for how we think about strategy. Um, also kind of talking about how a state's reputation has not only consequences for the distributive, which side wins the eventual bargain, but also the integrative aspects of bargaining as well. How states can actually enter into negotiations, I think is another uh, important implication of my research. And then lastly, overall, I think thinking about reputations as this political asset, something that you manage and not necessarily always try to strengthen. And so in terms of the policy implications, I think it's a way of addressing the so-called cult of reputation, this belief that you always need to defend your reputation. Um, you see the quote from President Obama, um, where I think a lot of uh, thinking is lacking is that you don't, we're, we're, we haven't yet provided strategic reasons for why backing down makes a lot of sense. Um, and so, and the other side of this um, coin is that the word, the term that we use to describe the opposite of having a strong reputation, the term weak, has obvious negative connotations, which again, for leaders makes it difficult to argue that that's what they're actually trying to do. And so this might be a way of kind of uh, avoiding uh, unnecessary escalation and, and uh, tensions. Um, 
more more specific to the Korean Peninsula, I think it's a different way of restructuring the debate on North Korea policy. So again, thinking about what South Korea's goals are, what the Amer uh, what the U.S.'s goals are, and how it is um, how to think about reputation, how to think about crisis behavior in order to achieve those goals. That's not only going to be deterrence. Deterrence always going to be an important one, but that's not going to be the only. And so more broadly, I've been thinking um, more about minimal deterrence, um, what's necessary on the Korean Peninsula, um, how do we assess what's adequate and appropriate, um, and how do we manage our uh, expectations about how we behave. Um, um, and also um, a broader project thinking about how we observe others resolve and intents as well. And so how do we assess North Korea's level of resolve? Um, and is it going to be based on past actions? Is it going to be more oriented towards the regime, the state, or individual leaders? Um, and th those are some of the things, um, topics that I think um, will help me kind of broaden out this research agenda that I've been working on. Um, so yeah, um, with that, I think um, I'll conclude and I'm looking forward to any comments and thoughts that people have. Thank you. We have uh, an in the room audience uh, and we have an online audience. All are welcome to ask questions. So again, online, uh, the method is to type in your question into the Q and A box that you'll see on your screen. In the room, if you wish to ask a question, please make sure the red button on your microphone is pressed so that those, particularly so that those online can hear you speak and then, and then uh, unpress it when you're finished. Uh, as as uh, often happens as, Moderator, I'm going to abuse my position and ask the first question. First question involves uh, the balloon in the room, not the elephant in the room. So th th this uh, uh, incident last week uh, was uh, an a interesting case for a lot of reasons, but I think it has, has some uh, implications for uh, reputation theory and, and the study of, of how uh, states try to uphold their reputation. So, so on the one hand, we saw the Chinese trying to uphold her reputation for righteousness and, and lawful behavior and taking the position that, that uh, the, the balloon had no nefarious purpose. It was simply a, for scientific research and, and there was no intent to send it over to the United States. And on, on the US side, we, we saw uh, the US president under tremendous pressure to demonstrate toughness to China for what many Americans perceive to be a, you know, an outrageous intrusion on American sovereignty. So I wonder if you're, your work on reputation uh, made you think of any particular uh, insights uh, that, that, that uh, maybe you haven't seen shared in the media that you could share with us? Um, great, uh, thank you. So uh, yeah, no, I think the, the loot incident has definitely been uh, interesting. I would actually pose you a question <laughs> in terms of, so thinking about um, one of the broader implications of my theory is that we need to manage reputations. And, and so I think um, it might be the case that given President Biden's or, or given our uh, preconceived views of what he represents as a leader uh, in comparison to previous leaders, such as uh, President Trump or, or President Obama, how, how the public kind of views him as a leader. Do we see him as strong or, or weak? And maybe how those public kind of uh, images of, of the president might have uh, influenced um, his decisions. I think, I mean, it's, it's me personally, I don't think President Biden had any other choice to shoot it down uh, given, given, the, given, given the factors involved and the pressure that he was facing. Um, another kind of, I think, in terms of the literature, I think one thing to consider is um, how reputations tend to be sticky. So if you have an image of a person, if you have an image of a state, not that much changes unless it's something very unexpected. So I think the question then becomes, what were the Chinese expecting? 
if, if the Chinese were expecting that Biden or, or any American president would shoot down that balloon, then I don't think it affects the calculus that much. But if China or other adversaries had a particularly weak view of President Biden and the current administration, and I think that's the only circumstance, I think, where the reputations are likely going to change. Or, and, it, and I think that's also true for the public as well. If you had expected um, any president to kind of do that, then you know, it's, and it's going to kind of confirm your existing beliefs and, and not you know, change that much at the same time. A uh, question from online. Uh, this is a little bit broader than you know, strictly talking about reputation. How do South Koreans feel about North Korea these days? Are these feelings noticeably different among different segments of the South Korean population? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, this is a tricky one. Um, uh, I think the, the, the simpler answer is I think you're seeing generational divides for, for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, the one thing that I would say is that uh, the North Korean issue has become less of a concern, I think, for most. Koreans, regardless of generation, there are, are certain uh, domestic social problems that the country is currently facing. But that's also tying into kind of generational gaps between the younger generation and the older generation. Um, and we have these, again, pre existing kind of gaps in terms of how we view the North Korean problem with, with the younger generation being less concerned. I think given the difficulties. Uh, within society, within the economy right now in Korea, in a lot of ways uh, amplifies concerns about a potential unification, right? What are going to be the costs? How is that going to affect my daily lives, which is already hard to begin with, and is harder than the older generation that many believe had it easier for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and so you see those generational gaps. Um, I think there is a level of indifference uh, but still, it is ripe for mobilization in terms of political mobilization. It, if a crisis occurs, you'll see it. You'll see public opinion shifting very quickly. But I think because of the latent indifference, it'll also kind of fade away that quickly as well. So I think that would be my impression of the North Korean issue. A question from the in person audience, Charles Morrison. You know, just a, a one comment, not a question. The comment is, um, I'm not sure strong and weak is the right um, dichotomy. It may be something more like consistency on one side and flexibility uh, on another side. And definitely, I think flexibility, particularly with respect to ta tactics, is something that may be prized and, and, and go along with resolution. But my main question really um, relates to the institutional context of leaders, because you've talked about leaders' cultural and personal preferences, their dispositions toward uh, risk-taking. Um, but uh, leaders operate in a, in a different institutional context. And so Xi Jinping's context is very different than President Biden's context. And it's not clear to me whether a more democratic or freewheeling political society is going to lead to more resolve or less resolve. Uh, and so I think that's a very interesting uh, question to kind of tease out as to how domestic political context uh, affects uh, these dispositions toward um, stubbornness for resolution on one hand and flexibility on the other. No, thank you for that question. Um, the inst institutional context matter, just to highlight what I, what I meant um, about the, the culture differences. So there have been the, uh, these very interesting kind of studies one that comes to mind is how, uh, within a comparison of American gov uh, American presidents, those that come from the South, that has a, a more stronger view of honor, which is closely tied to this uh, standing firm and, and trying to build a strong reputation, they actually are more likely to initiate crises. And so it might be those cultural backgrounds, um, which again, kind of can translate to, um, the differences between a democratic government and uh, an autocratic one as well. Um, one of the long-term projects that I've always had in mind is whether or not 
there are any differences. It's probably going to be nuanced, but the way in which we think about reputation might actually be different for Americans or, or Westerners versus the Chinese and Asians as well. It's going to be a very nuanced kind of uh, claim there, but um, those might also kind of lead to interesting arguments as well. In terms of democratic and autocratic leaders, again, this is something that many scholars have kind of debated throughout the years uh, in terms of you know the, the institutional constraints, the need to uh, appear strong to the public. Is that going to be stronger for a democratic electorate or is it actually stronger for an auto autocratic situation where if you lose power, the results or consequences are going to be much grimmer. So uh, there's definitely um, a lot more to kind of research there. Staying in the room, Nathan. Um, two questions. Um, the first one somewhat relates to yours, but how do um, domestic pressures or elements factor into your analysis? Um, looking at the two incidents, um, one can start to really think, oh yeah, it was completely different context going on at the time. And the second question is, um, in what ways, if any, has um, the DPRK demonstrated um, so soft, moderate, or flexible resolve, um, if you can't think of any with South Korea, perhaps there's something with China or the Soviet Union? Um, yes. So in terms of the domestic pressures um, in, in Korea, um, are you asking about the context of the question, uh, the, the cases that I was introduced in general? In general, but I think that those could be good examples. Yeah. yeah so um, uh, for the case studies, I use the domestic pressures as evidence that the presidents are going to be concerned or, or at least know that reputation is going to matter in that context. So they're, they're definitely caring about reputation. Um, for example, in, in the 1983 case, um, tensions uh, among the public were particularly high because this was following uh, the accidental shoot down, shoot down of a Korean airplane by the Soviet Union. So there was a lot of animosity towards communism, the first thing kind of baked in, uh, in addition to the rivalry. Um, and so those, there were definitely domestic pressures there. Um, one thing that I didn't mention, wasn't able to mention is that um, kind of related to the institutional argument as well, thinking about Chun's ri uh, rise to power, how he did it through a coup d'etat, which the Americans obviously were very displeased about, kind of incentivized him more to kind of show moderation, show that he wasn't always about the use of force, brutality, um, and he had this kind of more uh, bargaining side as well, which I think is definitely part of that particular story as well. Um, in terms of the DPRK, uh, I honestly haven't thought too much. Uh, this is going to be the, the kind of next part of, of the challenge. I think it, with, and always, it's always going to be a, a question of how to discern what's sincere and what's not. So in the case, uh, kind of going back to the, the case that I described in 1984, when the North Koreans offered humanitarian assistance, Everybody knew that it was a propaganda, um, but maybe, maybe not. I mean, so there's one thing, there's a question, and, and this is where it gets a little tricky, but there's one thing kind of how do you discern um, what the intentions behind a certain act are? And then the other question is, well, how is that perceived? Because even it could be the case that the North Koreans really had genuine intent. They might've been using, they might've wanted to use that as their own way of demonstrating moderation. But what, what really matters is how it was perceived by the South Koreans who are very um, surprised that the Trump administration accepted it in the first place, but also not that surprised when they found out that the, the aid that, there was, that was given was very poor. So the quality was very poor and that, that actually surprised no one. So it really, it, it's, it's all about perceptions um, that matters, which I think it does make it interesting to kind of think about uh, how uh, we, uh, not only in South Korea, but also the US kind of perceive um, North Korea's action. And there might be some that were in, indeed intended to kind of uh, signal moderation, but are we receiving those signals? Or are we kind of biased in some ways that makes it harder for us to kind of see them as that particular scene. So those are kind of the questions that I have. 
Hi, Dr. Park. I was wondering how significantly, if at all, does the state's military spending or posture contribute to its decision to cultivate a strong or moderate resolve? Right. So again, uh, thank you also for that question. I think here, kind of, it, it's important kind of ex to expand a little. So reputation is one part of the broader goal, which is to be credible. You, for, for deterrence to work, your deterrent has to be credible and uh, reputation is one component. And what you refer to in terms of military spending, um, it could have, I think, because it's another component of credibility. If you have a stronger military, then your threats actually might not have to be as credible for deterrence to work. Because even if it's less likely to work, if it does, if, if, if it is used, then it's gonna be more effective. So it mean, so there's, there might be an inverse relationship, so to speak. If you have a strong military, this might be the case for the US as well. You, it doesn't really always have to defend its reputation because once it decides to, do, to intervene, it has all this power, right? So uh, there might be this inverse or it could be the opposite as well. And this again, goes all the way into perceptions where you want to, in order to not use the military that you've built up, you want to make it credible. So you want you might want to use it in parts to bolster your reputation for resolve in order not to spend uh, or not to use what you've already built up. So there are different pathways, I think, um, uh, of, of, of addressing this, but it's obviously going to be related uh, in some shape or form. And it might be it might be different, uh, then it goes into different kind of aspects. What what is the situation surrounding that particular country? Or, what types of threats do they face? Is that kind of, uh, is it changing or, or do you see other uh, variables at play? And that's gonna also affect that relationship. We have time for one more question. Thank you, very interesting. And uh, I've got several points rather than questions, but I don't know if you cover these in your, your wider research. Obviously you are only able to give us a, a snapshot of what you've been working on. Uh, but to expand on some of the previous questions, first of all, in terms of foreign policy, you said it's important to not just look at the security focus. Uh, and I agree, but I, I think it's also important to not just look at the rational actor model uh, for foreign policy decision making. But given you're, you're trying to uncover why states make unexpected decisions or policy decisions, uh, you, you do need to look at the other models of decision-making introduced by Graham Allison, uh, but also look at the, the role of domestic politics, uh, domestic reputation. Uh, and the second point was uh, you touched on different types of reputations. And I think this is a really interesting and potentially very fruitful area, but also it, it's been developed already within the, the rational actor model variety, you've got the prestige of Robert Gilpin, you know, the day-to-day -day currency, and that still relates to the military power. But in terms of your what you talk about as the, the bargainer's dilemma, uh, if you look at the, the Fisher School or the Harvard Negotiation Project, uh, their elements of principled negotiation would actually emphasize that it, it's stronger, it's a better position to be in strategically to have a reputation for uh, negotiation, for principled negotiation, than it is to have a reputation for being a hardliner. So maybe a, a rep, reputation for resolution rather than reputation for, for resolve. Um, in terms of responses, also I think that there are different forms or levels of response that you can have a reputation for. Uh, one is massive retaliation. Uh, Axelrod, of course, emphasizes tit for tat, so proportionate retaliation. But also there's a conceptualization of something like tit for tat light, where you, you think about how many provocations you are willing to accept before you retaliate. Because as soon as you start retaliating, uh, then prospects for negotiation or, or resolution uh, dramatically decline. Um, also, of course, when we're, we're looking at costs and benefits uh, of acts, 
these do change if you're looking at iterated games, that how many times you're going to continue to interact with the same partners. Uh, so it, we need to address things like the shadow of the future. Uh, and finally, um, in terms of expanding even further your, your theoretical reach, maybe you could consider role theory uh, and how that's been embraced by different administrations. So sorry to just give you lots more to think about, but. No, these are, these are excellent. I mean, I think many of them kind of really align well. So the, the, the idea of principal negotiations, I think is another way of kind of thinking about the, the, the benefits of a weak reputation. Again, there it, it's more about kind of how do we escape calling it a weak reputation when nobody really thinks it's weak. It, it's just tempered down in some ways. Um, the tip for tat light, I think, is another way of it kind of explaining the minimal deterrence kind of theory where this these are the lines that we draw and this is how we intend to do it. And there, I think it's more about communication. Right. So these are the lines um, how clearly you kind of uh, convey them to your adversary and how willing you're uh, going to be transparent. And so that actually raises interesting questions about if you think about military strategy, it's always going to be about secrecy. It's about uh, keeping the other side on the toes. But in reality, it actually might be better to kind of have everything on the table so that the other side completely knows uh, what's at stake. Iterations out of the future, um, yes, definitely need to cons kind of sit, consider that. Um, uh, and, and role theory also kind of thinking about the different types of reputations. I actually started off thinking about a reputation for rationality. Um, kind of, but um, it, it, this is where it also, there's a risk of going down these rabbit holes because then you can kind of develop. They're not, they're all gonna be related. Um, and uh, for, for my own strategic reasons, I wanted to kind of focus on what's being talked about the most in the literature, which is reputation for us all. But I do definitely want to kind of expand uh, on that in the ways that you described. So, so thank you. We reached our time limit. How about another hand for Dr. Park? I thank all of you both in the room and online for attending this seminar. I remind you that East West Center Insights is a repeating uh, format. And we have another seminar exactly a week from now at which Professor Brendan Howe will be the featured speaker on the topic of non-traditional security cooperation for comprehensive peace building in East Asia. Until then, aloha.